Today, I am joined by my colleague, Pfizer Rizvi, and we have with us Dr. Yusuf El Shamari. He is the CEO and head of oil research at C Markets. He's worked as research fellow at OPEC and as a media commentator on global energy issues at the OPEC meetings. We're very thankful that Dr. Yusuf El Shamari could join us. I really want to start off by talking to you about. We know the significant impact of the oil industry's downturn. We know it has had an impact on the crude independent or crude dependent, excuse me, economies of the Middle East. Can you share with us a little bit of that impact in the region? Uh, all right. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, as you know, the, uh, uh, the Middle East uh, continues to be a, an economy that is mainly driven by uh, oil, the oil industry. If you look at Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Emirates, and other, other countries in the region, in addition to perhaps Iraq and Iran and Libya, in fact, the whole of the Middle Eastern region. It's the, re it's the region where you have the largest uh, reserves of oil globally. And, it, and obviously it's, uh, it's, a developing, it's a developing economy. And that's why it uh, continues to be driven by uh, the revenues driven from oil. In fact, most of the countries that make up OPEC are actually Middle Eastern countries. They make up at least um, eight, more than 80% of the, of the membership at OPEC. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, when you have an increase in oil prices, you will see the economies in the Middle East improving in terms of projects and uh, employment and other economic growth uh, um, uh, trends. But when, it come, when oil uh, decline, of course, you would see some impact on the economy as a well. whole. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll share with you what happened in Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia is the largest exporter of oil in the Middle East. What happened uh, when, since the decline in oil prices uh, last March because of the corona pandemic first, and secondly because of the, um, uh, the uh, an agreement that the collapse of the, that the, the Saudi Arabia, of course, and OPEC Plus didn't reach an agreement on curbing supplies back in March, oil prices have declined significantly to less than $30. And of course, that decline in prices would uh, lead to certain uh, impact on the economy. So Saudi Arabia has taken several austerity measures, uh, not just because of the decline in oil prices, but may also because of the other uh, adverse impact effects coming from the lockdown because of corona issues, because you know the, the whole country went and total, total lockdown, and that certainly will have an economic impact. So uh, just uh, last week, the finance minister has announced uh, several austerity measures in terms of raising the VAT from 5 to 15% and uh, taking off some of the allowances that uh, government staff would uh, normally take. So, uh, in fact, this is, not, but this is not the first time Saudi Arabia takes austerity measures. If you look back in 2016, when, uh, of course, there was also another um, uh, price collapse in, uh, back in 2014, but per perhaps not as worse as this collapse, but still, we, we are used to kind of these, uh, pr uh, pr let's say, price collapse shocks. And uh, as I can see now, um, uh, the, as a result of the austerity measure, the country is expected to save up to 100 uh, billion Saudi real. That's about between 30 to 40 billion US dollars. And of course, the kingdom can always it has got a uh, uh, financial reserve that it can always uh, that maintains its uh, high credit rating. So it can always resort to uh, financial tools in terms of issuing bonds, in terms of having financial bonds until when you have the price. Uh, of oil rising back again that can pay off all these loans and maintain its credit rating. So I would say it's not the first time for the Saudi economy to face such issues and I believe it will emerge of this crisis more and more resilient. Dr. Al Shamari, can you speak to Iraq? According to analysts, Iraq is one of the hardest hit re nations of the region with multiple projects on hold, I guess, due to all of the low oil demand. Do you expect the situation to worsen there in that area if prices don't bounce back in the short term? I uh, think so. Well, in uh, Iraq, as you know, it's a um, slightly different uh, region because there uh, you have also the uh, issues in terms of maintaining the total stability and security of the region. Um, uh, and uh, it continues to be, uh, the economy there is still continues to be very much dependent on uh, 
uh, oil revenues in terms of building the necessary infrastructure for the economy. Um, Iraq was exempted from, uh, in the past, in the beginning of uh, OPEC plus agreements, was exempted from several uh, cuts uh, measures, and that's to, to support it uh, rising to its, uh, to, uh, to, in fact, to support its rising economy. Um, uh, perhaps Iraq, it's not just going to be Iraq, I think Iraq, uh, Libya, Nigeria, and uh, even uh, Venezuela and other countries in the, uh, at OPEC. Certainly they will be uh, hit uh, at a, uh, much, um, uh, much harder than other, other countries in the Gulf. And that's just because um, uh, the economy of these countries is not as advanced as other, other countries in the Gulf region. Uh, for example, if you look at other regions like Emirates, like uh, Kuwait, and even Saudi Arabia, they, they maintain the financial reserve, and that's what makes them much more resilient. But in, uh, in Iraq or Nigeria or other countries, these reserves are, do not exist, and also the poverty, the income of uh, per person is much lower than other countries. And that's why I believe uh, if oil prices do not rebound back, perhaps they would have to take several austerity measures in order to um, try and uh, minimize the, the, the expenses upon the country and until that pandemic actually moves, uh, they move out of that pandemic. By the way, it's, uh, they will not only face uh, challenges because of the oil price, but also the, the health aspect, because we are now we are in a, in a crisis that is both economic and health crisis. So Iraq now is under total lockdown. Uh, even uh, if you go to uh, several countries in Africa, and many of them are OPEC members. So that will also increase the burden upon these countries to, and I'm sure they will have to take a lot of, uh, they will face challenges and they will have to take several measures in order to emerge out of this crisis. Thank you for that insight, Dr. Shamari. And once again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my question to you would be about the big move that came from Saudi Arabia on Monday, who announced deeper production cuts of 1 million barrels per day in June, in addition to the previously announced cuts, as we know. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And how successful do you think this move would be in rebalancing the market? All right. Um, as you know, I'll pick a plus uh, back in... Uh... Uh, beginning of uh, April, after the collapse of the agreement in the beginning of March, uh, did not, uh, because there was no agreement on curbing supplies, and then because of the major collapse in the prices, the group has managed to reach a historic deal of curbing 9.7 million barrels a day. Um, uh, of course, that will uh, we will have to add to that about 5 million barrels coming from North America, and these, would, we would say, forced cuts, unlikely uh, voluntary cuts from OPEC mm -hmm. Plus. And the IEA has also committed to taking about 200 million barrels of crude into strategic petroleum reserve, and that gets translated into about 5 million barrels per day. Um, now Saudi Arabia, just a couple of days ago, announced additional cuts of about 1 million barrels per day. That will be about th uh, 30 million uh, barrels per day. Uh, in, the in the total month of June, when the, this additional cuts will be implemented. In addition, Emirates will take 100,000 barrels and Kuwait will take 80,000 barrels per day. Uh, in total, you will have more than 35 million barrels. If you look into the supplies and uh, the, the demand in June, demand in June is expected to be uh, less than what OPEC Plus is actually, uh, is uh, not, not OPEC Plus, the global supplies. So I believe OPEC has... Uh, uh, this issue has triggered the attention of OPEC, and that's why they've taken that extra measures in order to uh, avoid rising inventories, and that will uh, uh, make the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, uh, in order to accelerate the supply and demand balance, reduce inventories faster, and also uh, not to delay the issue of uh, supply and demand back into perhaps 2021. Uh, so I think that has been a major issue. Currently at sea markets, we see inventories uh, reaching uh, to at least, staying at least above 500 million barrels through the year of 2020. And with that extra measure Saudi Arabia is taking, and perhaps even when uh, the group will meet uh, again in June, uh, Saudi Arabia, and as, as I heard uh, that several OPEC plus official delegates, they spoke to Reuters and 
they are in favor of not scaling back the agreement as they agreed on the in, uh, in April. So they are in favor actually of maintaining the whole cuts without without any ease. Um, so I believe, uh, and that's mainly because of the group that thinks that demand return of demand will take much longer because of the pandemic. And uh, also, we don't want to see any price collapse uh, happening back again. Even with this uh, 1 million barrels, by the way, announcement, you see the prices rose a little bit, but still they are not uh, high. And why, why is that? Because the traders are still concerned about the demand issues and over oversupply. So I think that's the, the reason why the, the kingdom has taken that extra measure. And I believe it's an indication that the group may be in favor of maintaining the current cuts without any ease uh, in the upcoming uh, meeting in June. Right, right, Dr. Shamari. But we all know the last few months have been one of the toughest for the oil and gas industry. But moving forward, with the OPEC plus production cuts coming in and the gradual easing of lockdown all over the world, what's your take on the recovery of demand and oil prices in the second half of the year? Okay, currently we see uh, better than before uh, demand recovery for road transport. As you saw in April, uh, the demand for uh, global demand declined by about 25 to 30 million barrels uh, per day. And uh, with the, so in, in, in May, this demand actually is rising to about uh, 83 million barrels. So there is like an improvement by about 5 million barrels per day that's uh, May demand. And that's mainly due to easing of uh, lockdown issues that has happened uh, in uh, several economies that mainly the uh, EU uh, the, and, uh, and perhaps some, some, some states in the United States. And in addition to Asia, of course, as you see, China, China is uh, currently coming back much faster than uh, other countries because, of course, they had it fast. Um, so that has pushed demand a little bit higher for road transport, but still the main issue is uh, aviation. And aviation makes about six, uh, about six percent of the global demand. In fact, if you look at the uh, uh, the total demand for transport that we expect this year for road transport is expected to reach 42 million barrels by the end of the 2020, and that for road transport. But aviation, uh, and that's still about 10% uh, less than last year demand, which was about 47%. Uh, and aviation is not expected to recover until mid of uh, 2021. So we expect demand to reach about 93 million by the end of, by, by Q4 2020. And that will be about 7% less than last year demand. Uh, and uh, as, But one thing that we have to mention here is that demand can be higher than supplies moving towards the second half of this year. So I, we expect supplies to be about 80 to 85 million barrels of global supplies, and demand uh, will be higher than that, will, will exceed 90 million barrels. So the markets will right. be oversupplied, but that oversupply, not necessarily to increase prices because there's too much in stocks. So that will enable faster withdrawal from stocks. Right. You made a good point there. Well, Dr. Shalchamari, on one hand, we know the pandemic caused extreme demand destruction, but then the situation was worsened, if I may say, by the price war and the disagreement, like you said, between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But do you think the next OPEC Plus meeting could offer some relief for oil producers, the next meeting in June? And what sort of events can we expect would unfold during the next big meeting of the OPEC Plus um, well, um, uh, what, I, what we expect for the next meeting is that uh, we've seen some, uh, because OPEC will always monitor the demand developments and price, of course, or price may play a major role in that. Um, uh, as you see, uh, prices now are still $30 because still the total lockdown measures, by the way, they are still in place despite uh, easing of many countries. Um, so uh, I, would, I wouldn't expect OPEC to increase production or even ease of production if prices continues to be at this level. And if you look at, uh, of course, I, I do not take the, I don't expect that they will deepen the cuts, uh, mainly because I think uh, perhaps Russia would, uh, wouldn't perhaps be in favor of making deeper cuts because deeper cuts perhaps would uh, increase prices and then they, I think they will be concerned about 
perhaps rising of shale oil producers in the United States and the market share issues. And, but I believe uh, demand will pick up. And I think OPEC plus current cuts are certainly sufficient if uh, demand uh, and, uh, uh, comes back because of, uh, you know, uh, as the virus, uh, this virus still, still uh, we move out from this corona crisis. Um, uh, so that's number one. I don't expect that they will ease the cuts, and I don't think they will deepen the cuts. So we expect uh, maintaining the current cuts with perhaps, we, as we see some uh, voluntary, additional voluntary cuts from Saudi, from Emirates. From, so that's something we call overcompliance. Perhaps you would see some overcompliance from some countries, but the current cut, I think, will, may, will remain in place. Dr. Ashimori, as oil prices of U.S. shale collapsed and companies shut in production, you know, companies trying to kind of reinvent themselves at this moment, U.S. service companies like Baker Hughes, Halliburton, and Schlumberger, we've seen some of them express interest in expanding operations in the Middle East, possibly in the second quarter of this year. How successful do you think that initiative could be in the Middle Eastern region? Uh, well, uh, Halliburton, Schlump, uh, and uh, many of the uh, service companies have been in the Middle East for a long time. I, in fact, I am one of uh, Schlumberger employees about 15 years ago. So, and I think uh, they are an important part of uh, the oil industry in the Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia. Um, they have huge operations uh, going on uh, in terms of uh, cementing, drilling, well constructions, uh, wire line. You have a wide range of services that these companies are doing for the oil industry here in the kingdom. So I believe uh, with the expansion of these countries, if they want to expand the operations of the kingdom, you would, you would need to see uh, expansion of uh, operations. Aramco has announced uh, major uh, new fields uh, in the northwest uh, of the kingdom. And uh, as you also, we've, uh, there is uh, a new gas field in the kingdom that will start operation in 2024, and I believe it's one of the world's largest uh, Gas fields is called Al Jafora. Um, so these companies, even if the, the kingdom, by the way, cuts its oil production, uh, exploration and field development uh, business continues for Saudi Aramco. And I believe they uh, will always be in business, uh, despite, just even if the kingdom uh, reduces its production. Certainly, if the kingdom increase production, perhaps these companies will have more operations to do. And uh, I'm sure they will always have an opportunity in the kingdom as, as long as oil, the oil industry continues to develop. And the oil industry in Saudi Arabia will at least be for 50 years to come. When, because Saudi Arabia, although it is diversifying its economy, but it still maintains large investments in its oil industry. And this is very important to maintain the security of global, uh, global demand. So security of supply for global demand. Well, we really appreciate your take on this and your expertise and really you sharing all of that knowledge with us, Dr. Alshamari. We wish you all the best. Stay healthy and safe. And thank you on behalf of Pfizer and myself and Heart Energy. Always a pleasure, Jessica and Pfizer. Thank you for having me. For more Heart Energy videos, follow our social media channels.